Good morning again, church. Take your Bibles, if you will. Let's join together in Psalm 120 and Psalm 122. Psalm 120 and Psalm 122. If you don't have your own copy of the scripture, when the service is over, make your way to the welcome desk. We'll be glad to give you a complimentary copy so you can have that, not only for when we worship in the word here, but as you daily have the opportunity to have time with Jesus. That's part of our Hope for One by 100 campaign is that every single one of us in the church would have a daily time with Jesus, that we would offer ourselves to others as we gather to worship and as we leave here to serve, that we would pray for those who are near to us and who are far from God and that we would expect God to bring revival. That's what those four letters are talking about. And it's the hope that we have in Christ that we want to deliver to the world and that we remind one another of every week as we gather, but that God reminds us of every day as we open up the word. We believe that the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. And so we we want to be in the Word every day, hearing from Him so He can shape us and use us and share that hope with the world that is around us. But if you have that that complimentary copy, Psalm 120 and Psalm 122 are on page 346. Page 346. The Psalms are are near the middle of the the Scriptures, and they are the the songbook of the, the Jews. These are the songs that they would have sung as they gathered on the Sabbath, as they would sing together. They were preparing their hearts and their minds for what God wanted to teach them and who they would become. And so just as the songs meant something then, they, they mean something now. But it's far more than just a feeling that we get when we gather together and sing songs. It, it is that God is shaping us. So today we, we want to look at two of a, a collection of songs. These are the Psalms of Ascent. Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 are a collection of songs that the Jews would have sung as they were approaching Jerusalem, as they were gathered together as people and making their way up this hill, as they could see the temple in the distance. They, they wanted to prepare their hearts. They wanted to prepare their minds. And, and they really wanted to prepare their community for an encounter with God himself. And so these songs helped them. So today we're going to look at two of these psalms. And over the next seven weeks, we'll look at all of them. There was several years ago, this contest between pastors. They said, who, who can preach the shortest sermon that is still complete? And who doesn't love a short sermon, right? Everybody say amen. Amen. Everybody loves a short sermon. Yeah, you won't get one today, but I know you, you love those. So. But there was a pastor who submitted a three-word sermon. And that three-word sermon, he won the contest because you can't get much shorter than three words. The three words are this, turn or burn. Turn or burn. He said it's as complete as you can get. And, and it's true. In, in John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, John 3, 16, the most famous verse in all the scripture. God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. But God, John goes on and says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's right. For, for everyone who believes is not condemned, but those who do not believe are already condemned because they haven't believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So that, that sermon is about as complete as it can get. Either you remain in your sin, and you will spend eternity separated from God in a place of eternal torment called hell, or you turn and you come to Jesus. And yet there's far more than simply a decision to come to Jesus. There's far more than just a public declaration where you have baptism. It, it is that that there is this new life in Christ, that what scripture shows to us is this daily desire to walk with him, this daily renewal of his spirit in us, this daily walk that, that is fresh. So that it's far more than simply saying, I, I, I want to turn to Jesus so I don't spend eternity in hell. It is that I want to turn to Jesus and I want to yearn to know him better every day. I, I long to see him do fresh things in my life. And it's these two ideas that we're going to see today in these two Psalms that that begin to give us the fuel that we need for two years of this campaign of hope for one by 100. That if we're going to have a daily time with Jesus, it won't be because it's easy and because your schedule just makes time for it. It's because the Spirit will be energizing you to do that and disciplining you to do that. If we're going to spend the next two years offering ourselves to others, growing in Christ so that we can help others grow, it won't be because it's convenient, but it, it is because the Spirit is putting this desire in you to know Jesus and help others know Jesus. If we're going to spend the next two years every day praying for someone who is near to us but who is far from God, 
that won't be because it, it is a natural thing. It's because it's going to be the supernatural desire that as you know Jesus, you want those around you to know Jesus. If we're going to spend the next two years expecting, coming into this place on Sunday mornings, hoping that, that God's going to do something fresh, otherworldly, that this place will be different than any other place on the planet. If we're going to do that for two years, it won't be because we just drum it up within us. It is because the, the Spirit is at work. It is His power at work within us. Yeah. And so these songs are going to show us that, that this walking with Jesus is far more than a feeling. Like, like some love song might, might stir emotions or, or some rock ballad might get you ready for a, a game or a workout session. It is that these songs are going to help us to see the, the true mindset of discipleship, of a long obedience in the same direction. So three things that I want us to see from Psalm 120. And the first is this. God says that a long obedience begins with a cry of distress. A long obedience begins with a cry of distress. Look at Psalm 120 with me. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Lord, rescue me from lying lips and a deceitful tongue. What will he give you? And what will he do to you, you deceitful tongue? A warrior's sharp arrows with burning charcoal. What misery that I have stayed in Meshach and that I have lived among the tents of Kedar. I have dwelt too long with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. In those first five verses, the, the psalmist is looking at his world and he cries out in distress. We often, as we gather on Sunday mornings, are hoping that we're going to sing songs that, that create within us celebration or or that, that give us some warm feelings. But what we don't do very well is lament. There, there's an entire book in, in Scripture called Lamentations because God's people looked at the brokenness that was around them and they lamented. Jeremiah wrote down emotions into words to lament the brokenness that was around them. And one of the things we, we don't do very well is to walk into this place and to admit that, that we're coming in here because we don't want to be out there. That what the psalmist was doing, and, and as the, the Hebrews would have gathered together, and as they were marching their way up that hill to the temple, it would have been this collective declaration that the world that they lived in was not their home, that they were declaring, God, we don't like the way this world is. We are fed up with the way things are, and we want to live differently. I've mentioned a time or two, and it, it may not have registered with you yet, but this is an election year. And, and you're, you're going to see some campaign commercials. You, you'll see some campaign rallies. And, and whatever side of the aisle that those campaigners may be, they're always asking you to compare where you are and where you want to be. And, and, and they present their case that you should vote for them because you don't like the way things are, and they'll help make that better. There is within the psalmist something even deeper that, that he says, I'm looking at the world and I'm realizing that there's no politician who can solve this situation. There's no military leader who can solve this situation. There's no social setting where I'm going to feel better and this is going to get better. And so he calls out in distress. Look what he says in verse one. In my distress, I called to the Lord. Right. And so one of the greatest things we can do as we gather to worship is to look at one another and say, we need this. We, we need the Lord. We together collectively need to call out that this world is not our home, that this is not the place where we should get comfortable. And we, on a, a weekly basis, we gather here and we want this experience together to be otherworldly, to turn our attention to Jesus, to open up our hearts to the moving of the Spirit, to recognize that, that the world is a world of distress and we need Him. Look what He says in verse 2, Lord, rescue me from lying lips and a deceitful tongue. That, that as he looked around, he realized the people around him were broken. That the world in which he lived was, was full of people who could never fully keep their promises. That, that it, 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 was, it was a world where people were liars, deceitful. Rachel and I were thumbing through the channels just this week, and then there's a, a new game show coming on uh, called The Anonymous. And we, we watched the commercial and looked at one another and said, what is that about? Had no idea from the commercial what was going on. So I went to the reliable source of Google 
and 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 looked it up. And and it is a game show where there are people living in a home, I don't know, 10, 15 people, and intentionally lying to one another. They they in public with one another say all the right things, but then they can get in these individual pods and they can say what is really true and they're intentionally deceiving one another face to face. That's the kind of world in which we live. That, that if we admit that those around us, as much as we may love some of those people, as, as much as we may trust some of those people, if we are to compare our world to God himself, we realize, God, this world is broken. Isaiah saw that in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah's world had crumbled around him. The king had died. Isaiah, being the, the prophet, knew that, that he had to lead, and yet he wasn't sure what to do, and he came into the very presence of God. And as he saw the holiness of God, he, he cried out, woe is me. For I, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, that, that rather than comparing himself to others and saying, well, I'm a prophet, or I'm better than they are, or, or at least I don't do these things, Isaiah took this opportunity, and he looked at the holiness of God, he said, I just, I don't even measure up. That, that your holiness is so perfect and powerful that, that I need you to, to come and to touch me. That even though I've been set apart and even though I am your prophet, I, I'm lamenting, I'm crying out in distress. And, and the psalmist says that if we're gonna walk this long obedience in the same direction, if Jesus is calling us to come and follow him and to come fish for men, and the only way we'll do that successfully is every day to cry out to him and to say, if you're not in this, I have no hope. Well, if you're not going to give me the strength and the direction and the holiness, that this just will not work. And then as we gather every Sunday morning to sing together, it's this reminder that we need this because we are turning our attention to the one who is perfect and holy and powerful. But even more importantly, we're calling out to the one who will answer. Go back in verse one. Look what he said. I called in distress to the Lord and he, he answered me. Just as, as Lauren was mentioning, there, there are many times that you're praying and you think God doesn't answer. And yet we know from history, God answers prayer. We can look through scripture and God listens to his people and he responds to people. God answers. There are some of you that have a best friend. Teenagers, you know this way better than anybody. You've got a best friend, and they're only six missed text messages away. That you can call them five times. They'll never answer, but eventually they'll be there. But they say you're your best friend. I'm always here for you, but it takes you five or six times. Some of you are elbowing one another right now because you know that person. That, that you, you know that there is this trust relationship, but you're never going to get them on the first call. Parents, how many times have you called your children and they don't answer? Can you say Amen. Amen. You wonder, why am I buying this child a phone if they're not going to use this phone? And then they'll say, well, you should text me. Well, I texted you 18 times and it says read, but I don't think you actually read it. There, there has to be this relationship where not only do you call out, but he answers and God is that kind of God. Right. That he, he's going to answer. Rick Warren used to say that, that God will, will typically answer you one of four ways. As you're praying, there, there are some times that he will say, Go. He will say, yes, let's move forward in this prayer. But sometimes God will say no. That, that as, he, as you pray, he answers. He just doesn't answer the way you want. And he'll say, no, that, that prayer isn't holy or it, it isn't in line with what I want. But there are some times that God's going to say slow. God's going to say, you got the right idea. It's just not going to happen as quickly as you want. But there are other times that God's going to say grow. You've got the right idea and the right prayer, but you're not ready. You need to grow. Go, no, slow, or grow. God's always answering. It just may not be exactly like you want. How do we know that? Because Scripture tells us that. Our stories, our own personal stories, tell us that. In Jeremiah 33, verse 3, God says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I'll tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. God is a God who answers prayer, and so what we need every time we gather to worship Worship in song and worship in the word is to cry out in distress and say, God, we recognize this is who you are and you're a God who answers. And we live in a world that's broken. And, and we don't want to grow so comfortable here that we stop looking to you. And so look in verse six, it's the second point on your handout is that God leads his people to repentance, to the long obedience. That as we cry in distress and we look at the brokenness of our world and we look at the goodness of who he is, look what he says in verse six. I have dwelt too long with those who hate peace. I have dwelt too long 
with those who hate peace. He, he says, I, I admit that, that I'm, I'm in a world that is filled with people who really don't want the things of God. And that's, that's why we gather here on Sunday. It's why we set aside this place because it's this continual reminder as you look around, it's like we're, we're all in this together. That we are a family and, and we've left behind the world and the things of the world because there, there are regular things that are happening. There are people at restaurants right now that are eating. There are people at grocery stores who are shopping. There are sports that are, that are occurring right now, but we've intentionally stepped away from those things because that's not our home. And we're not living as the world does. We live differently because we worship a God who is not of this world. There are many of you who had the opportunity to go on vacation this summer. It may have been for a few days. It may have been for several weeks. But it's likely that when you went on that vacation, you packed your belongings in a bag or several bags. And, and when you arrived at the, the hotel or the Airbnb or the guest house, whatever that may have been, you, you unloaded in some form or fashion. For some, you just open up the suitcase and you live out of the suitcase for a few days or weeks. Some are a little more organized or, or uh, OCD, and they're going to take it out. They're going to put it in drawers and in cabinets and hang it. But ultimately, you realize, this isn't my home. I, I'm not staying here forever. And so it's never quite comfortable. You don't have your things. You don't have your chair. You don't have your coffee cup. Because you know, this isn't my home. And what happens is when we come to Jesus and, and we've turned to him, we no longer want the things of this world because you realize this isn't my home. But one of the reasons we don't really want to gather as much on Sunday mornings is because we've become too comfortable in the world. And we want to make it home. And, and, and we like the things that we have rather than recognizing these things are broken. These things are temporary. And I have the opportunity to step out of the world and into the presence of the one who answers my prayers. Oh. This is what is required for the long obedience is a cry of distress that says, this isn't my home. You're the one who answers prayer. And I live among the people who for, for too long have wanted things that are not yours. And so there, there is this repentance. There, there's this looking to God and who he is. And he says, I've lived too long. And so I want to walk in this way with you. And so the reality is that when you come to know Christ, there's a, there's a moment in your life where you come to him and say, I'm dead in my sin. I've recognized it, that what has been told to me is true, that even though I may be a nice person and I've come to church a lot and I've got my own Bible and I take notes, I, I'm dead inside. I, I'm dead in sin. And I need to come to Jesus because he's the only one who can rescue me. And Paul tells us in Romans 10, that if you call, if you confess, you will be saved because God answers that prayer. And so in distress, you call and in repentance, you turn. Because you, you don't want this to be home anymore because it's empty and it's, it won't last. And so the, the psalmist and, and, and all of these Hebrews, as they were singing this song, they're making their way up the hill and they realize we're calling out to a God who listens and we're leaving a world that is broken and isn't a place where we truly belong. Then the third thing is in verse seven, the third point in your handout, is that God strengthens the repentant in this broken world that we look to him in our distress and we know he answers. We repent and we begin to walk with him. But then we realize we, we repent every day. That it isn't that we have to get saved again every day because the scripture says that, that when you come to Christ, you are sealed with his spirit. Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4 talk about this permanency that comes in that relationship. And yet it isn't a permanency on which we, we simply rest and, to, and wait until he comes to get us. It is this permanency that says, now that I'm in the family, I want to start living as a member of the family. Now that I've become a part of the team, I want to start participating as a member of the team. Now that I've been grafted into the body, I want to function like the body. And so every day there's a repentance that says, I don't want to live the old way. I want to walk in this new way because I know who I am. Look what he says in verse seven. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Literally in the Hebrew, it's two words. I, peace. That the, the, the being verb there is, is understood. I am for peace. I, I am peace. That, that you realize without God, I'm broken, I'm empty, I'm dead. But I've been transferred and I've been transformed. And so now I'm this person of peace. And so now he knows this new identity. And because of that new identity, he says, I don't want to live in the world. I don't want to be like the world. And so there's this daily reminder of though, though the world will advertise to me and though, though the world will, will seduce me, those those are empty things. Those are not who I am. My new identity is an identity of peace. And peace 
the word shalom in the Hebrew is this idea of really the presence of God. Jerusalem, the, the, the city of Jerusalem means the place of peace because that's where God dwelt. And now imagine if God himself, the Holy Spirit, lives within us, we are people of peace. That, that we wake up every day and say, this is my new identity in Christ, is that even if the world is chaotic, even if there are lying lips that are around me and, and people who are broken and warlike, I've got this new life in Christ, this new identity. When I, I was really young, I had two older brothers, Steve and Joe. Steve was 13 and Joe was 10 when I was born. And, and so as I grew up and began to, to know them and, and really began to relate with them, they, they were in high school and they were great athletes. I loved them. I idolized them. But I knew something was different because they were dark-headed and they were tall. And I was blonde-headed and I, I was young and small. And so they did what any loving brother would do. They would say, well, you're blonde-headed because you've been adopted. <laughs> you look different than all of us because you, you've been adopted. And of course, you believe everything that your brothers tell you. But there was, there was one day, I, I, I was much older. My brothers had married and moved off. And I was in high school and had come to church one Wednesday night for supper. And there was a gentleman at our church that night. I didn't know he was there, but he had known my granddad, my mom's dad. They, they had been in church together years earlier. And he had come to visit our church in Mount Pleasant that night. And I walked in and he saw me. I didn't know any, I have any idea who he was. He saw me and he leaned over to my mother and says, you don't have to tell me who that is. That's Kurt Talbert's grandson. Well, that's my mom's dad. And so mom's telling me after church about this. She said, yeah, Brother Alton knew exactly who you were because you look just like my daddy. I said, I'm not adopted. I really have genetic connection to the family. And it, it gave such excitement to me because my identity was secure. I knew no matter what my brothers tell me, I am not adopted. So imagine the power that comes from knowing your identity is in Christ. Mm. That, that you live in a world that's broken, but every day you can cry in distress to him. And even better, you have come to him in repentance, and now you know I have been made a person of peace. Christ is in me. And so now I can walk this long obedience because I have turned to him, and he has answered me, and he's forgiven me, and he's transformed me, and he has filled me with himself. This new identity leads to a boldness. He says, I am for peace. But when I speak, they're for war. Teenagers, you've probably already seen this. You, you've gone to school this week. You, you had God do some great things in your life, and now you're back on your mission field, and you're trying to live out this new identity, this fresh walk with Jesus, and people aren't interested. They're not interested in, in how you're reading the Bible or, or how your life may have changed or, or the, the new alignment with your life. They, they want to go their way and do their things. They want you just to come right along. Parents, you, you've seen this too. You, you're trying to raise your children in certain ways and, and the culture makes it very difficult. People make fun of you or question. And yet if we know that we've turned to him and there is such boldness because of our identity in him and our trust in him, then we live out this peace even when the world's going to make war against us. There is a power for a long obedience that comes from turning to him. But it's not just turning to him, it's yearning for him. And this is what we're going to see in Psalm 122. And so this is the, the, the next two points, the final two points in your outline. The fourth point is this, God moves his people to delight in his community. God moves his people to delight in his community. Look in Psalm 122. Let's read those six verses, excuse me, nine verses. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city, should be solidly united where the tribes, the Lord's tribes, go up to give thanks to the name of the Lord. This is an ordinance for Israel. There, thrones for judgment are placed, thrones of the house of David. Pray for the well-being of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls, security within your fortresses. Because of my brothers and friends, I will say, may peace be in you because of the house of the Lord our God. I will pursue your prosperity. These final two points very quickly. Point four is God moves his people to delight in his community. God moves his people to delight in his community, not only to lament over our brokenness and, and to come to him in repentance and peace, but then to realize oh, he's called me personally, but he's not called me privately. That, that we have the opportunity to gather and to celebrate together. And there's something that happens when we gather together that cannot happen when we're separate. Look again there in Psalm 122, verse 1. He says, I rejoiced 
with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Is that what happens on Sunday morning when you wake up that you rejoice that you get to come here? If you're honest, there are many of you who will say, Brother David, I don't think I'd call what happens in the car rejoicing on the way. That, that it's a little tense sometimes, that, that we've been scrambling and trying to get together. And, and I totally understand that. I, I was talking with a young couple before church. We had three at home. Cashel was 10, Hallie was five when Gabe was born. And, and so we, we had kids going every direction. Youth ministry, children's ministry, preschool ministry, different campuses. I, I, I get it. And Rachel could tell you even better because many Sunday mornings I was already at the building and she was trying to get the kids ready at home. Sunday mornings can be really difficult. You know, when Lionel Richie wrote that song, Easy Like Sunday Morning, it wasn't because he was getting ready for church. <laughs> you just know. And yet there was for him this rejoicing. Why? Because it was this declaration that we, we're in this together. We have this community. We are made for a community that worships together. If you don't think that's true, go to Death Valley on a Saturday night. Go to Baton Rouge. Even on a Saturday afternoon, there's going to be tailgate parties all over. Because people love to come together. They, they love to eat good food. They love to celebrate together. And when things are great, they're, they're rejoicing together. When things are bad, they're lamenting together. And why is that? It's because we've been made to worship, but we worship the gods of this world far more easily than we worship him. Come on. And you're going to see worship happen over the next number of months, whether it's high school football or college football or professional football, because we've been made to worship, but we often stop short and we worship the creation rather than the creator. And it is in this long obedience that we look at this world and we realize there are so many things that it offers that are broken and empty and not eternal. And so we turn to him and then we say, I want to go worship him with my church family because it's this continual reminder of how he has rescued us and how he's given us this new identity in him, a new belonging with one another and a new purpose to share this hope with those who are near us, but who are far from him. So that every week we get this recharge. Every week we get this opportunity to, to pour out all of the garbage from the week and then to, to take in this opportunity of celebrating him and enjoying one another. No wonder he said, I was so glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. It, it was that, that they were going and in their going that they were acting on what was true. That what's interesting, he says, I, was, I rejoiced when they said this to me. But he, it, it isn't based on our feeling. I mentioned Eugene Peterson last week. He, he is the one who wrote the book, A Long Obedience, in the same direction. And I owe so much to him as we've studied and prepared for this series. And, and Peterson says that it, in the book, he says, I put great emphasis on the fact that Christian worship, Christians worship because they want to, not because they are forced to. But I've never said that we worship because we feel like it. Feelings are great liars. If Christians worshiped only when they felt like it, there would be precious little worship. Feelings are important in many areas, but completely unreliable in matters of faith. Paul Scherer says this, the Bible wastes very little time on the way we feel. Right. I mentioned football already, and, and every year as football season comes around, I, I, I think back to my football career in high school, particularly my senior year, one of the, the, the best years of football that Mount Pleasant had had in a long time. And, and we that year became legends in our own mind. It, it was a, a great year. We, we went deep in the playoffs. The city was behind us. But I think about so many of the lessons that I learned, but not even that year of football, that, that fall of 1989, but particularly the spring of 1989 in, in that, that off season between football seasons. Coach Joe Cluley was our head coach. And Coach clearly saw we were just on the cusp of something great. And so he was pushing us and challenging us. And so we, we'd get out to the, the locker room every day for those off-season workouts. And, and we would, honestly, we'd dread them many days. Some days we were going to the weight room. Some days we were going out to the track. Some days we were going to the field to do agilities and team building. And there were many days we knew it was going to be hard. And so as we were putting on our 
t-shirts and our shorts and lacing up our shoes, there wasn't a great deal of rejoicing because we knew what was coming was going to be hard. But it was interesting, every time we'd finish, after we'd finished the weight room and we had lifted more weight than we thought we could, or we went to the track and we ran a little faster than we had the previous time, or, or we were out there on the field and some of these plays are beginning to mesh, it was interesting, as we left those places, we felt like doing those things. We didn't feel like it when we started, but we sure felt like it when we finished. Coach Cluey said, men, know this, you can act your way into feeling much more quickly than you can feel your way into acting. He said, if you all came to the locker room every day and I said, guys, what do y'all feel like doing today? You wouldn't feel like going to the weight room. You, you might feel like going out and playing a little flag football. You, you might feel like just sitting at the locker and doing homework, but you wouldn't feel like doing agility. You wouldn't feel like doing these things. He said, but isn't it interesting after you've had this good experience, now you feel like it. You can act your way into feeling far more quickly than you can, can feel your way into acting. And if you're waiting until a good Sunday to come to church, those will be few and far between. But if you come because you've repented and, and you're gathering with God's people because Jesus is worth it, I promise you that when you leave this place, you will feel like having worship because you worshiped. It will change the way you feel because you're acting on what is true, even when your emotions may be lacking. This is why they could rejoice when they said, let's go worship because they knew what was about to happen. They were going to come into the presence of the eternal God. And so what's going to happen as we gather every Sunday in this place, as we sing together, as we study the word together, as we pray together, as we observe the ordinances together, it is that we are acting on what is true. And so God is going to strengthen us through that repentance. It is turning to him and then finding strength in turning to him that we become the very people he's made us to be. And so finally, the, the fifth point on your handout is that God stirs his people to pray for peace and prosperity. As they would come to Jerusalem, they, they would pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They said, there's no other place on the planet where God lives. His, his spirit resides here. And so God, would you bring peace to this place so we can always come to this place? And so how much better then that as we gather here on Sunday mornings, that, that when, when great things happen, not just emotional things, but as we share, here, here's what's happened this week as I've had my time with Jesus. Here, here's what's happening because we're offering ourselves to others. Here's what's happening because we're praying together for those who are near us but who are far from God. We start seeing lost people who are saved. We, we start seeing the people whose prayers are being said yes to. We, we start seeing marriages restored and, and lives redeemed. And, and there, there begins to be this prayer that said, God, do it again next week. God, I can't wait to get there because I want to hear the stories of what you've been doing because you're a faithful God who answers our prayers. You listen and, and you empower. And so now there is not just this turning that says, well, I didn't want to go to hell, so I came to Jesus. It is this desire that says, I've come to Jesus because he makes all the difference. And I gather with his people because there are things that he does when we gather that he can't do when we're scattered. Can you go to the golf course and worship? Of course but you can't worship with others on the golf course. Can, can you go on vacation and, and worship a, on the beach? Absolutely. Creation testifies to the glory of God. But it's when you're going to the golf course or the beach or that game that you're often going for yourself or for your kids or whoever else it might be, but you're not going to that place for the glory of God. It is when we gather here that, that we are recognizing there's no other place I'd rather be than here. There's no other family with whom I want to worship than this family. And it's in coming together that we turn to Jesus and we yearn for him more and more. And we see that he stirs us to say, God, keep doing it. Bring your peace in our lives and your prosperity to us. Not the prosperity that, that simply says there's, there's more money or more comfort, but the prosperity that says there's more of your spirit at work in us than ever before. That, that what, what is happening here is, that as we gather, we're fulfilling this structure in our lives and fulfilling this command that God has told us. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 10, don't stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It is that we fulfill this, this structure for which we're made, this command that's been given to us. And then we hear the word, we sing the word, we watch the word played out in community that can't happen anywhere else. And so it is in turning and yearning that we begin to find the fuel we need for the long obedience. 
Master Worship team to come so that you've got the opportunity now to respond to what God has been saying. That, that as we've seen today, there's this call of, of desperation. It says, God, only you can deliver us. And that we want to walk diligently with you, find our delight in you and give our devotion to you. So a moment after, after I've prayed, we're going to stand and the encouragers will be here. And, and some of you might come and say, I, I realized today I, I do need to turn. I've never repented of my sin. And today I want to follow Jesus. The encouragers will be here and help you know how to do that. But some of you might come to one of the encouragers and say, I, I've got to admit, I don't, I don't have the, the yearning that this song talks about. And, and I, I want to long for Jesus like that. Some of you might come down here to these letters of hope. And you might take one of these white rocks and, and drop it in the jar to join with all the others who've dropped those white rocks to say, I want to have a daily time with Jesus. Or you might come get one of these orange rocks to say, I, I want to offer myself to others so that I can grow and they can grow. Or you might get a blue rock and, and say, I'm going to pray for someone who's near me who's far from God. I'm going to get others to pray with me so that we can share the hope of Jesus. Or you might come take a yellow rock and, and drop it in the jar to say, I, I want to be expectant for God to move over these two years like he's never moved before. but we call it an invitation because we want to invite you to respond. Invite you to say yes to whatever it is that Jesus is calling you today. Let's pray together. Father, would, would your spirit move so that we do that very thing, that we say yes to you, that we would turn from our sin and ourselves and we turn to Jesus. Right? And then in turning to him, we, we would find what we have been looking for all our lives. God, would, would you draw the lost to yourself? Draw the saved into a deeper thirsting and hunger for you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. The encouragers will be here. You come as we sing together.